Happy Sabbath, Church. Today's scripture reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 and 13. I'll be reading from the New Living Translation. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ, some of us are Jews and some are Gentiles. Some are slaves and some are free, but we all have been baptised into the body by one spirit and we all share the same spirit. May God add his blessings to this reading. Good morning, Church. I um, thank you for your warm welcome. I do wonder how long I've got to be here before I stop being new. But um, it's all good. Uh, I expect to over six years. Or, uh, I expect to take a break. Three. It's lovely to be here, and it's lovely to be able to worship again with you. Today, I want to ask the question: What do we mean when we say the word church? What do we mean when we say the word church? It's a good question. Do I have any answers? House of God. We say the words, we're going to go to church. Or we go, you drive down the road and you turn left at the church. Yep. What else do we mean by the word church? God's temple? Did you want to, you meaning building again kind of thing? You meaning the building again? Yeah, okay. Any other, any other takers? Where else do we use the word church? A place of worship, pardon? The people worshipping, did you say the people worshipping is church or in church? In church, okay. So again, in the building, yep. So sometimes we use the word church to... Uh, mean, which church do you belong to? And then we go, well, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist that goes to Armadale. The one in WA, not the Armadale with an I that's in a different state, yeah? Just to make sure, I loved it. Us, the people, we are the church. Yeah, you, you've heard this before, haven't you, George? <laughs> George used to be uh, at a, a church that I was leading before. For me, the church is one of, this, this idea of the church is one of the things, one of the concepts, one of the biblical principles that we get wrong. It's so ingrained in our culture, in both Christianity, in, in who we are, that we just, we keep getting it so immensely wrong. The church is not a building, biblically. When the word the church in the New Testament is used, it does not go, we're going to go to the church, and we mean a structure that has a roof of any description or walls. It is always the church is the people of God, with God in their midst, doing the things that God has instructed them. We could be meeting out under the trees. Although given that it's the surface of the sun out there, we may not want to do that. We might all faint from heat exhaustion. We could be gathering in what somebody's house. We could be gathering at the park, down the beach. We, we, wherever two or three individuals who worship Jesus come together with Jesus in their midst becomes the church. It's fascinating because any other usage is wrong. As much as I, I understand we use that language from those. We use that language. And we all know what it means, right? When we say, hey, we'll meet you at the church. Or, or turn left at the church. We're in a building that looks a certain way or a style. But it's biblically wrong. I want to share the next few times I'm, I'm opening the scriptures with you. Several of the key kind of ideas 
in the New Testament especially that define what the church is. Because I think that sometimes we have misconceptions and we, we add human thinking in where the Bible is very, very expansive on what it means to be the church. Most of the New Testament wouldn't be written if it wasn't describing what the church is about. Because almost every part of the New Testament is about who is the church, how are we meant to be the church, and what are we meant to do when we gather together as the church. Most of the letters that Paul wrote are two churches telling them how they're to behave together. In fact, Jesus in the Gospels, when he's walking, it, it, it describes not only his death, but also him trying to raise up the church, the disciples who would then become his church, his gathering of people. Revelation is a book that's all about God's church victorious and making it through some difficult times. So today we're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, if you've got your scriptures, turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 12 comes right before a really, really famous chapter, which is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Wow, we can count. Thanks. Yay! 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we call it the love chapter. It's used in almost every wedding that I've ever been to. Love is patient, love is kind. Wonderful ideals that have nothing to do with marriage in the Bible. Some of you are like, well, hang on, I use that in my wedding, right? The reason why I say that is because context is everything when we read the Scriptures. And 1 Corinthians 11 and 1 Corinthians chapter 12 are all about the church, the people of God. And then it goes on to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and says, treat each other with love, love is patient, love is kind. Again, great principles to build a marriage upon but it's actually Paul teaching the church, this is how you should treat one another. So, so it can be used for marriage, but the first application is how we treat one another. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it goes through a list of spiritual gifts, and then I want to pick it up from verse 12. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, and I just want to read through this section, and today I'll be reading from the New International Version. It says this, The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. We are all baptised by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. And we are all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, I'm not a hand, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason stop being part of the body. If the ear should suddenly say, because I'm not an eye, I don't belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body was an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body was an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. He goes on. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honourable, we treat with special honour. The parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honour to the parts that lacked it so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honoured, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church, God has appointed first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, and those with gifts of healing, those able to help others with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers? Do all work miracles, do all have the gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts? And then it goes on to talk about love. 
I love this image. I love this biblical picture of what it means to be the church. It describes us as the body of Jesus. We, together, when we gather together, we are the very body of Jesus Christ. Not literally, as in, we're not physically his flesh. Imagery. We are the body of Jesus. So when we act, and when we, when we speak, and when we, when we praise, and when we worship, we are performing the duties and responsibilities that Jesus wants us to. To perform. It describes us as his body. Do we have our identity in Jesus? Well, we should do. That's what it means to be his church, to be his body. We are not the body of the Fremantle Football Club. I don't know why you'd want to be, but, but if that's what you chose, I'll talk to you later and I can pray for you. Um, we are not the body of... of Whatever, it is, whatever other organization or group that we choose to be, we are the body of Jesus Christ. Our identity comes from him and how we are connected to him. It's, it's, some people get upset with me because I, I say that when I ask, they ask me, who are you and what are you? I say, well, I'm a Christian who's a Seventh-day Adventist and I'm also a pastor in that church. I'm, I am a passionate Seventh-day Adventist. But my first form of identification, I am a Christian. I am connected and I get my identity from him. I worship in and I'm a leader of the Seventh-day Adventist church and I believe in the Sabbath and I believe in the tenets of, of what we believe. But I start with my identity in Christ. That's where I get my identity. Because I, I'm a part of his body. The body of Christ. In Ephesians chapter 5, in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul, who also wrote Corinthians, so he's going to agree with himself in many ways. In Ephesians chapter 5, there is a section that's actually talking about wives and husbands and how they should treat one another. But we're not going to get onto that today. It's, but there's a section in the middle of that in verse 29. And verse 30, which pulls this out a little bit more and says, After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. He is what brings us together. He is what takes care of us. Jesus is the one that feeds us and, and blesses us and holds us together and keeps us together. It is in him that we have our identity. And not only our identity, but also our direction. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 18, it says it this way, but in fact, God has arranged the parts of the body. It wasn't, it wasn't Pastor Kyle who arranged the parts of the body. It wasn't Langton who arranged the parts of the body. It wasn't you who arranged the parts of the body. It is God who sets the parts of the body in the place where they want to be. It is God who sets us up to be the body and as such he puts us in the place we need to be when we're needed to be there so that we can do the job that he asks us to do. He's in charge of us. If we are his body, not only do we get our identity from him, but we get our purpose from him. In verse 24, it says it's similar in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 24, it says, But God has combined the members of the body. God has combined us together. God has brought us together as his church. How's that? You are here as a part of his body because he wanted you here. That's not exciting at all. Everyone's asleep to that one. You are here because God wanted you here. You are a part of his body because God wants you a part of his body. Not because somebody else ordained it. 
but because the God of the universe saw fit to look down upon you and go, you know what, I think you would be suited to belong to part of this church. That's a wonderful thing. That should bring you purpose and joy. And to know that you belong because God wants you here. In verse 28 of chapter 12, it says that God, God has the one who has appointed people for their tasks. Again, not Kyle, not Langton, not any pastor or leader or not anybody else, but God has given you the role that he's given you. And so he has bought and formed his body together so that we can be his body doing the things that he wants us to do and to give us the mission that he wanted us to have. And what is the mission and the purpose that God gives his church, the body? It's a question. What's our purpose? Why do we exist? To let other people know that they can be a part of the body too. Isn't that wonderful? That they can be a part of the community of God. That they can be saved through the blood and the sacrifice of Jesus and they can belong to the body of Christ both now and for, for eternity. It's a wonderful promise. That is the job that we have been given. That the purpose that God has given and placed upon us to be a part of his church. I, um, I love this image in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Unfortunately, I have also been around long enough to know that sometimes churches, sometimes bodies of Christ, forget what it, they're meant to do as a body of Christ. And sometimes bodies of Christ, I have found churches that, that think that their purpose is to... Oh, I'm just going to wait for the Lord to return and take me home and I'm just going to keep getting fed more and more and I don't have to do anything. Now, I know that there are lots of medical professionals here. If I was to sit and do this for the rest of my life, What's going to happen to my body? My, my muscles are going to deteriorate. There are muscles in here, by the way, for those of you who can't see them. Uh, they, they are hiding a little bit, but there are some here. Um, right? If, if, I don't, if I don't actively move and do the things that my body is designed for, and instead I decide that I'm going to be inactive and not fulfill the purpose that my body was designed for, my body will deteriorate and die. So there are two options when we are the church. We can either be the church of God, doing the things that God wants us to do, and, and fulfilling the purposes he's got us to do, which include worship and prayer and, and, and sharing and serving one another and serving the community. Or we can sit on our chairs doing nothing and deteriorate. They are the options. And only one of those options is given by God. So I know which one that I want to be a part of. God gives us the instruction to go into all the nations, into all the speaking groups, into all the streets, and to share the message of hope in as many ways possible so, and to make more disciples. That's the purpose he gives us as his body. And as we're united by him as the head of our church, when we're united by him in purpose, when we're united by him because he's the one who brings us all together and we're about his job, about his purpose, about his mission, then we are the body of Christ. 
There's two other things in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 I want to pull out today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. There's lots of talk in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 about the fact that there are different parts of the body, right? We're different. Hate to point that out to you, but you don't all look like this wonderful specimen of a man before you. You laughed, that's okay. I, I accept laughter at me. Um, everybody else was, was kind of okay with that, I think. Um, if we all looked like me, that would be really boring. Don't shake your head too much. <laughs> but it would be. If we all acted like me, if we all spoke like me, that would just be annoying having to listen to my own voice all the time. Thank you for the grace that you show me when you do it. We are different. We're different heights, we're different shapes, we come from different places, we have different languages. We also have, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it describes we have different skills and abilities that God has gifted each and every one of us. And if we all tried to act and talk like Pastor Kyle, or we all tried to act and talk like, like, like Innocent, if we all tried to act and talk like, like the people who sing up the front and did what they did, we would not be the body of Christ. Because what they do when you sing, and you guys who sing, you are amazing. Um, if I took the microphone and let out in the singing, this, this building would be empty very quickly. It is not my gifting. It is not what God has asked me to do. It is not what he has placed in me to do to be a part of the body. I would damage the body by doing that. And that's okay for me to know that. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 uses the idea of, of body parts and goes, hey, we're all different body parts. There are arms and ears and, and eyes and noses and mouths and, 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 and legs and, and all of us are significant and needed in the body. There are two things that takes place in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 as we go through. It starts in verse 14 and 15. It says, Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. Covered that. Verse 15. If the foot should, should suddenly go, you know what? I've had a look around at the rest of this body, and I've decided that hand is wonderfully manicured, and it looks fantastic, and it's really good at whatever it does, and I, I'm really not a hand, um, and because I don't look like the hand and I don't act like the hand and I don't sound like the hand, I don't belong to the body anymore. Can you just picture that, by the way, in your mind? Like, I don't, my, I've got, my, my imagination goes a bit crazy. I'm just picturing my foot going, eh, not a foot. Anyway, um, what does that mean for us, the church? Sometimes... We are tempted as human beings to look around the gatherings that we find ourselves in and we look at what other people are doing and saying and acting like and dressing like and speaking like or praying like and we go, you know what, I don't look like them. I don't sound like them. I don't fit in with them. Anybody ever felt like that? No, just me. Oh, there's one. Oh, thank you for your honesty. Right? Everybody else is lying. Right? Okay, cool. I, I, we'll talk later. I'm not calling you liars. I'm just saying, hey, there's a part of us that, that when we enter into groups, when we enter into gatherings together with other people, we want to fit in. It's part of what we do. There's part of our human nature that wants to be a part of a group and act and look and, and, and be the same as everybody else. But God has designed the church so that we're different. Praise the Lord for that. You don't have to sound and talk like Kyle. Amen. Right? Because gentlemen, there's only one of me and your wives married you, not me. 
Praise the Lord for that, right? It's okay to be different, but when we sometimes come to, to gatherings of Christians, what happens is we, we're like the foot in the story and we look at everybody else and we go, you know what, I don't look like them, I don't sound like them, I don't pray like them, I don't sing like them, and because of that, I don't fit and I'm leaving and I'm out of here. Don't leave, please. We need your difference. We need the way in which you view the world and God and read the scriptures. We need your faith and your experience. We need your diversity because without it, we're walking around without a foot. We need you in the church. So please don't leave if you're discouraged. Because sometimes we feel that way. There's a second problem that takes place in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. Again, there's a part of me in my head that's trying to picture my body parts talking to one another and what that would look like. But um, Can you imagine? Can you imagine being a part of a group, coming along and, and joining in and participating and praying and worshipping, getting to know people, and then somebody walks up to you and says, you know what, we really don't like you being here anymore, get out. That would be horrible, wouldn't it? To be rejected like that by, by a church or by a gathering where they just go, you know what, we don't need you or want you around anymore, get out of here and leave, never come back. I have never, never heard of a church doing that in that way. However, I have been in many churches and have seen many Christians that have done that without realising. Let me explain. When the hand says to the foot, you know what, I don't need your giftings and abilities as a foot, I just want you to sit there or I want you to pretend to be a hand. Can the foot pretend to be a hand? No. We, it, it can't do it. That's not what God has gifted the foot to be. But sometimes as churches, we, we either consciously and some, often subconsciously go, you have to look and act and behave like this model of whatever it is, and if you don't, we are going to not tell you to get out, but we're just going to make it uncomfortable. We might ignore you. We might not talk to you. We might not invite you up to participate or lead out. We might not listen to your voice when we're having input on decisions. We don't do, we're not, we're not going to tell you to get out, but in a lot of subtle ways we make people feel unwelcome. And that is not okay. It is not okay that we as the body of Christ take the place of God and decide which body parts should and should not be there and how the body parts should act or behave when they're a part of the body. That's not our job. That's God's job. But so often, the church can sometimes try to force all of us into a mould to be like us. I, I had this week, I was chatting to a couple of people, and someone said, oh, we're a bit concerned because, you know, new pastors, they like to change things. And we don't like change, someone said to me. And I went, well, you don't know 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Because what happens when somebody new comes in and God has gifted them with abilities and talents and giftings, they must influence the body. And if I don't let them influence the body, right? I'm not saying, just talking about Pastor Kyle, it's just for all of us. Then what we're really saying is that, no, we don't want you, the, right? Because as soon as somebody new comes into a congregation, the body changes. I'm not saying I'm going to change everything. I'm just saying that change is natural when we have body parts join. 
And we shouldn't be scared of that. It's just part of having new people, new experiences. And we need that. I love how 1 Corinthians unpacks this. We actually, it's not just that I, I want to put up with you the hand or you the foot who have come along. It's actually that I need you to be a part of my life so that I can grow as well. Have you ever experienced where your body parts need each other? Yeah, it happens, right? Sometimes you, kick, you stub your little toe on the corner of the furniture in the middle of the night when you're walking somewhere and you don't turn the light on or you don't see something and your foot hurts and your foot tells your head that there's something massive and there's a problem and then your hand goes and opens the freezer and gets out an ice pack and, and, and covers it, right? And then your other leg kind of takes more weight because it needs to. We need all the different parts of our body because we need one another if we're to grow in, in, in grace and in mercy and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We need each other to be the church. The body of Christ. Here for his purpose. Here for his reason. Gathered together because of him. You belong. I cannot stress this enough. Whatever you're feeling right now about Armadale Church, whether this is your first time being here or you've been here for 30 years and uh, I'm new blood, right? You belong in this church. You belong as a part of the body of Christ. And there will be times where sometimes churches and our church may sometimes do things and say things that will discourage you. I might say it. I, I'm not going to do it intentionally, right? But I might say it. Don't leave. We need you. Be different. Be who God has made you and help us all to grow in the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. On the other side of that coin is this, that we as a church, as the body of Christ, need to find ways to be more inclusive, to find ways to involve more people and, 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 and bring out their strengths and their abilities and their giftings that God has given them so that they can feel that they are a part of this church as well. So we have a responsibility to, to, to stay and to, to, to do more to be a part of the body of Christ, but we also have a responsibility to reach out and involve more parts of the body and make them feel welcome and to love one another, as 1 Corinthians 12 says. I want to finish with this promise in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 27. Because so often I have encountered people who have left church or churches altogether. And almost every time it's not theological differences. It's usually because they feel unwanted, unloved, ignored, overlooked. This is the promise. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now you, us, we are the body of Christ. And each and every one of you are a part of it. You are the body of Christ. And each and every one of you are a part of it whether you are one, whether you are 15, whether you're 25, whether you're 105, right? You are the body of Christ together and each of you have a part to play. You belong here. You belong as a part of his body.